Hello. Sioni Gara, Adinusti Dawato, Jalakia Yesli, Digega, Kaliliga Nikita Ichiluki, Ali Ichiluki. The Institute of American Indian Arts respectfully acknowledges that it is located on the traditional Puebloan land of the Tanoan and Kara speaking peoples. We honor and thank them for their graciousness as stewards of the land. My name is Gabriel Schneider, and I would like to welcome all of you to our reading today in celebration of the 2022 IAIA anthology, Burn to Emerge. It has been a privilege working with the anthology crew this semester. Our team this year consisted of Brianna Reed, Debon Victor, Rebecca Santos, Robert Hakas, and Professor Kim Parco. Thank you all for all of your hard work. I think I speak for all of us at the anthology when I say that it has been an honor to receive so many wonderful submissions from the very talented student body here at IAIA. Thank you all for being here today and to all of our viewers from far away. Before we begin our readings, Professor Douglas Boots will give us a blessing. Oh, Matakiapi. Betukile watch day. It's good to see you all gathered here today. Akuyatani Akahuk Amai Mantui Moni Yomahana Amai Toka Gadaiwa. we give thanks to uh, the earth beneath our feet, the sun, sky overhead, the uh, wind from the four directions, the water. I give thanks to all these things for uh, allowing us to come here and gather today and uh, hear the words, hear the voices of the uh, students here at IA. IA. Um, it's a powerful thing, your voice, you know, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and hear your words, and that's why we're here today, is to honor those words, honor those stories. Um, Sometimes you'll hear about the danger of a single, single story. Uh, and I think that's what we're here to uh, celebrate at IAIA, is the diversity of stories that are out there that need to be told and need to be heard. So uh, I thank you all for being here today. Uh, Aston Koshler to watch over each and everyone gathered here as they come and uh, go. And may you find your homes the way you left them when you return. And uh, may you continue your studies, you know, continue to develop those talents that you've been given as you uh, spend your time here at IAIA and enjoy the companionship of those that are on a, a, a good road that way too. So I thank you for allowing me to say a few words and um, look forward to hearing all of your uh, stories, poems, etc. Thank you. Wopi Latanka. I think that's why they gave this to me. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, introduce our first reader today, Camilla Bird Romero. She was born in uh, northern New Mexico in 1991, resides on Artewa ancestral lands in Oque Owenge Pueblo with her three children. In 2011, she began attending IAIA and has studied fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. The birth of each child sparked distinct writing styles and influenced her themes, themes of maternity, femininity, generational power, and womanhood. She writes for her Tewa people and for the grandmothers before her. She will receive her BFA in creative writing from IAIA in the spring of 2022. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. I will be reading uh, the two poems that will be featured in this anthology. The first, Mountain Garb. She could pluck mountain passes between forefinger and thumb, strum them, toss tree skirts up 
nose close to pine cones, sweeping up the rocky range snow caps. She was cleaning house, dusting off the mountains and the mother that slept through 15 winters. Wake up, up, up. Scarves warmly keep necks from snapping, sloppily sliding down the side of a giant. Intoxication was poured into her coffee, earmuffs, memory. She has a bruised tailbone from running, stumbling through wind chill flurry out of the canyon, blurry, spinning, flipping out from under her mother's frozen shoe. Her forefinger and thumb could strum a flask instead of a mountain pass. But that is hibernation. Now is the time to wake, wake, wake. In the elevation, in the melting snow, just make it muddy. We are fresh out of herbal remedies. The compass is broken, dropping down the side of winter. The second piece, reviewing the maternal. Are they generational? Are they cultural? Nature versus nurture? Is it my own? Do any of the above make noise to children with fresh oye, ears, dear? Shu, fo, fofendi, black hair. These are your anto, prayer shoes. They are formal unmemorized. But in review, baby clings and presses his palm to mine like I have been his mother forever. I am gravity, or earth, which came first. Milking moon, dusting earth. I am mead moon, hair moon, must be a moon. Earth does not phase this way. Do any of the above make noise to me? Po. Water, moon, elk, my name, cloud headdress wearer, no sketches of her, him, that makes noise to everyone. The brass bells bringing them forth, summer woman barefoot in snow, mother belonging to my father, it all belongs to me. Thank you. I think our list ran away. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I get to introduce David John Bear McNichols. David is a wizard who lives in a spray painted shuttle bus in downtown Santa Fe, New Mexico. He is the author of Lemons in an Orchard, Lies, and Callously Wanton. Mr. McNichols is also a great hunter and a liar who believes that misinterpretation is everything. He can often be found talking to animals or playing electric noise guitar inside his bus. He enjoys skateboarding, yoga, and cigars. David. Thank you, Camilla. Um, thank you for reading, that was beautiful. <clears throat> What I've brought today is an imitation poem. In, uh, in our Poetry 2 class, we read Heather Cahoon's book. Um, what was it called? <laughs> yeah. There's a picture of a bird on the cover. Yeah. Anyway, um, I really took to one of her poems, read Ozier Spiders, and as an assignment, I wrote a imitation poem of Red Ozier Spiders by Heather Cahoon. And my poem is called Drunk Electric Sparks. A touch of bruised satin, drunk electric Barbed wire scars selvage the open air above a late collapsed cape rotting on bloody point. 
This collapse has fallen in suicide three short ages since to rot lonely the ghosts of interred engineers lost when trickling under deep rivers and waters washed out roots over source into spring. The voice beyond ears, this vague nerve breaches him, they buzz. Some faint flashing sparks among the quanta and dark muttering above the shrub trees inside the walls. And I am honored to introduce a Nimkiwa White Eagle, who is a young artist living in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He is enrolled in the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians and is also of Kiowa descent. He won the Youth Art of Technology Award at Santa Fe Indian Market in 2018 and won Best of Show at the Heard Museum Student Art Show in 2019. He is a first year college student, currently enrolled at the Institute of American Indian Arts. He is studying fine arts with a focus in digital art and plans to also study creative writing next year at IAIA. Hello, thank you. Um, so the piece that I'm gonna be presenting today is a memoir that I wrote for my English class. Uh, and uh, I was planning on reading it today, but I also submitted a uh, recorded version that I did um, that, is, that includes a soundscape. So uh, I'm decided that I'm going to uh, have the, uh, I'm gonna present that one, uh, the recorded version. Uh, we had to write about a memory um, and so I decided to write about two memories, uh, sort of a similar, uh, the piece is called Presence, and in both of these memories, I felt as though my presence was, uh, you know, not seen. So, uh, I'll just have you play it, honestly, it's easier, I'm not going to explain it up here. So would like. Presence. Her eyes filled with urgency. The teacher worked as a shepherd. She directed a herd of us four-year-olds into a tight, straight line. We pointed out into the tiled hallway. The bright sun glistened through the dust-speckled windows, revealing streaks of water and bleach. The earthy smell of pencils was combined with a stench of perfumed cleaning products and social anxiety. The line of kids was bubbly and electric. The teacher said we were headed outside. Behind me I felt a breath, and in front I saw a pale neck, blonde hair standing up straight. We should play cowboys and Indians, one of the kids behind me barked. The world was new to me, but I knew I didn't like this game. Maybe because it was only a game for the other kids. They played a role. I could only play as myself. The kid in front of me turned around, he was two inches shorter than me, and yet his gaze and voice seemed to phase right through me. Aren't the Indians all dead? The soft air brushed against the giant pine trees like a cat. Leaves rustled until they broke free and floated gently down to the water surface. Their edges flickered as the sun's beams pierced them through the tall trunks. We watched these pale yellow boats sail down the stream at our feet. Our phones had no service up in this mountain. We were alone with each other's words. At least that's how they felt it. I knew the forest was listening, as it always will. This was the first time we hung out as high school graduates. This would also be the last time we saw each other before we left for college. Despite our differences, I had grown to appreciate every one of them. We formed connections through our minds, not our faces. I looked to my right, catching the sun's glint in my friend's bloodshot eyes. He breathed in the wind and turned to me, releasing it back into the air, now warmed with his voice. The setting had sparked a thought in his mind. Imagine coming through here as a settler, when there was nothing, no cities, no roads. As the words fell from his tongue, my back tightened. 
I thought of my ancestors' territory that almost had no bounds, piercing through both borders. The millions of people who traded in all directions, and every metropolis of white faces that was once a city of brown. I opened my jaw, my tongue readied with these thoughts, but then I stopped. Instead, I said, yes, when there was nothing, absolutely nothing. I respected him, I knew he wasn't an idiot, and my tone was enough for him to reconsider what he had said. Quickly, his child wonder turned into a bitter embarrassment, and all he could mutter was, oh no, I... I only grinned. My smile faded as I looked back to the rocks and the water rushing around them. When we sat down on the bank of this stream, I saw the little boys who bonded over video games and the delicate art of being an asshole. But now I saw six men. Yes, very young, but I couldn't help but imagine the many young men who had thought the same thought as my friend, who didn't reconsider their words. I remember that day in school, standing in that line, defending my place in this existence. I remember how the teacher stood idle, with no intent of defending me. She sat expecting an answer like the 19 children at her feet. My invisibility wasn't a result of child naivety. They're no longer children. Their parents never taught them differently because they thought the same. Their education told them so. The school system hadn't failed them. It did its job. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about it a little bit more after you've uh, listened to it. Uh, that piece was about um, two memories, one in preschool and the other after I graduated from high school. Um, and I, did, I, didn't, I never really connected those memories in my mind when I, you know, before I wrote this piece. But that first memory from, you know, despite only being four years old, it stuck with me. Uh, just from such a young age, you know, as an indigenous man, person in this country, uh, from a young age, just not being seen. And then again, after high school, sort of the similar thing happened again, but this time with my, with my best friend. And the difference though was that my presence in his life in high school was, it had the power, it was enough for him to just understand that, you know, just, just for me to be seen, because there's so many people our age that, you know, don't have indigenous people in their lives. And so that whole entire realm of history, I, it's just, they don't, have to, they don't have to consider it because they don't know people, no, no indigenous people. Um, so that piece was just about my presence in people's lives. Uh, but uh, I'm going to uh, be introducing the next reader, uh, Shar Turtelot. Uh, she is from the uh, Menominee Indian Reservation, located in northeastern Wisconsin, uh, where she spent her youth in the fields of Middle Village and inside her mother's garage. Shar began school at the Institute of, of American Indian Arts in 2016 and majors in creative writing with her emphasis in fiction. She graduates in May uh, 2022. Uh, she, she resides in Santa Fe, New Mexico with her sister. So I'll read an excerpt from a larger piece called 13 Ways of Looking at a Cloud, and it is dedicated to the first teacher who ever gave this little shit-ass truancy kid a chance. <laughs> Observe the young person in the passenger seat of an old red beetle riding down a creamy asphalt road. The driver, my sibling, is a 14-foot tall giant with an obsidian braid pinned to their spine and fingers crafted from salmon hue quartz and moss that grip the wheel. And the young woman, whose hair is chopped at the shoulders, sits with frail hands dry as a desert bone, fidgeting in her lap. They are not the most exciting pair that I have seen over the last millennium, but the one with my braid is my blood, so I watch on. <laughs> 
The passenger studies my kin's features vigilantly as they concentrate on the road ahead. I feel the heat of her gaze, props to my baby, si baby sibling, for I would have sunk my teeth into her neck the moment I felt pressure on my skin. We don't enjoy interfering with the affairs of our otherly relatives, but every now and then we get a case as such, which then another is forced to step in and oversee this tedious dynamic. So here we are. The young enforces the saliva pooling inside her cheeks down to wash the taste of instant waffles from this morning's breakfast away. She stops fidgeting to hug her stomach and lean back into the seat. These back roads furl and bend as if it wants you to throw it all back up. I pick at my gums with a spare rib of a sap sucker. Riding inside our cars can make one feel like ascending 100,000 feet to the top and gashing the space which separates us from the creator or God in half, which is precisely the idea. The giant continues to drive as they glance, they glance over at you after a giggle slips from your lips. The beetle, giant, and you continue to drive deeper into the boondocks. Every mile, the cloudscape looks different. Some are skyscraping billows of cotton feathers, and some are marble sculptures carved by amateur, hollow-hearted artists. I indulge on those types for brunch. You look back over at the giant, who drives with one hand sticking out the window. The wind makes the fat hanging from their arm wiggle. You raise your eyebrow at the giant thumb. Stop staring, they snap. You nod and avert your gaze back onto the road. The bypass takes you further into unfamiliar terrain. Yet every corner taken, the landscape becomes intimate. Variegated woodlands embrace your presence. Thom the giant begins to pull off to the side of the road and comes to a stop. With sweat dampening your shirt, you shift in your seat and face Thom. What are you doing, you ask. I could sure go for a cinnamon roll. Thom hops out of the buggy and trots to the trunk. They bring a sheet full of steaming naked rolls to the front of the car. You watch, you jump out and watch as they stretch their neck towards the clouds and marvel at their effortless swivel as they harvest. Every bun comes back and has a good slather. Thom offers you one. Did you know that your ancestors were resourceful bakers? You can find the larger piece on the anthology website. So the next reader I'll be introducing is Fidel Frank. <clears throat> Fidel Frank founded a community group called Dene Introspects in 2016 while being the first member to complete his time at Shiprock AmeriCorps. He has been volunteering at the Healing Circle Drop-In Center since 2013. He helps with community events like restoring and celebrating family wellness. Recently, he held an online founders event on 2-22-22. With the assistance of the IAIA counseling team for his project, Tua Halstoy, sorry, <laughs> unfiltered. His creativity utilizes multimedia for mental health issues, L LGBTQ, dis eating disorders, and preserving Dene. And another word I'm not going to butcher. Hello, I did not plan any of this, so I do not know what's going on, but I showed up. <laughs> okay, so the first piece I'm gonna read, I dedicate this to my auntie because she passed away last Wednesday. So I'm in a state of mourning, so I come to you before you're like dressed in red, everything is in red. I don't know why I'm seeing a lot of red, but I'm just embracing it. Uh, so 
2022, this year is like a burn to emerge. Benishne, I remember Miss John's science class field trip, haunted, something weird about school at night. Ask anyone from Shiprock, what's Area 7? Don't drive Nappy Road at night. I want to watch Chills with Arif Rahman. I'm so delusional. Mr. Money say it's gone then. Cada noche. My demons hide every single night. I cringe at my early works. <laughs> I used to call my life a nightmare. Now it is a story going accordingly. I keep dreams to myself more. What is another closed door? That's the first one. <laughs> and then the second one is called Nehema Nehistan, which is, it means Mother Earth. I wrote this before COVID, so before mass back in 2019. And then I also incorporated another piece which was rejected and I was told it needs to be like workshop, but I was like, what needs to be workshop? <laughs> okay, so anyways, I put it in this piece and I'm gonna be singing it. And it's my first time taking my mask off and I may cry because it's for my auntie, so I don't know who's gonna be playing, but you can play the song now. It's called Nehemoth Nehastan. I can barely hear it. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone that showed up. You're just as important to the readers as an audience. So I just want to give a round of applause for everyone. <laughs> okay, I guess I just play it from here. I don't know. Woke up in the days, thoughts going different ways Like sound waves that fall into the grace Sailors colonize a disenfranchise Religion, a force, the cause of many wars Whitewashed books oppressed with genocide Firewater consumed the flowers that no longer bloom No one to hear you cry, only smiles of light off to suicide So faint, I can't hide Christianity, insanity, no one cares about humanity The truth of it all covered by mainstream lies I can still hear the earth's dying cries I can still feel the world's endless sighs. Must Sunday's prayers dissipate nightmares. Ancestors' prayers come through these global scares. Nehemiah <laughs> Grandma, Uffert, Gilly, Berta, Dina, but Berta, it's too soon to say I miss you. Nehema, Nehastan, Hakonan, Nehema, Nehastan, Hakonan. Birds fly in the clouds. So why? birds fly in the clouds. So fucking high. Nehemiah done. Hagonon, 
نحما نحسان هاكونون birds fly in the clouds so high birds fly in the clouds so high I did my best, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, do I just present the next person on here? I don't know what's good. Okay, who's next? I don't know. <laughs> Nathan. Nathan? Let's see. Okay, Nathan T. Lowe is a Danette aspiring filmmaker based between the Southwest and New England. He's currently going after his BFA at Institute of American Indian Arts. Oh, this school, sorry. <laughs> I sounded like a robot. Okay, growing up in Tucson, Arizona, Nathan's interests revolved around films and the art of cinematic storytelling. At age 12, Lowe decided to pursue filmmaking as a career path based on his accumulated, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm not reading English well, sorry, accumulated years of film knowledge and true passion for cinema. He found a community arts center in Cambridge, Massachusetts and joined the teen media program where he became one of the official videographers, editors, producers, whoa, shit, okay, sorry, and judges for the Do It Your Damn Self Film Festival. Give it up for Nathan. Many people don't think about how the bus station truly affects our society. In fact, I dare say not many people give a second thought about how important the bus station truly is. And it is through this author's opinion that the bus station is truly one of the most important and spiritual places on earth. Specifically, the Red Line bus station within Harvard Square. But no doubt there are other stations around the world that are truly magnificent. And it is within this Red Line station in Harvard Square that our story takes place. This day, the 72 bus to Huron Avenue was running particularly late. Thinking about how late he'll be for dinner, Nathan started to point out the number of people within the station. Some were the usual high schoolers on their way home, families on their way to cook dinner themselves, and people out planning a fun Friday night. And of course, the usual suspects of homeless people that love to make the station their housing and sleeping quarters. Nathan was accustomed to the vagrants around Harvard and even assigned little nicknames for each of them. Fellow with cerebral palsy who liked to walk around the station was sometimes nicknamed as Stumpy. There was Eric Perry, a Frenchie who had a particular eye for eclectic bibliographies. And there was One-Eyed Jack, an ex-marine who had a missing eye. If there's one thing you can learn about Nathan's naming process is that, at the time, it was exceptionally rude and not that clever. Can you blame a 14-year-old for his lack of vernacular awareness? Suddenly Nathan felt a chilling air purveying throughout the bus station. He found himself confused because the familiarity of the bus station environment had just shifted significantly. Looking around the station, Nathan found no suspects to pinpoint the shift in the air. But it was here that he suddenly realized what loud ticking sound was being made. As if coming from a large grandfather clock, the ticking sensation almost echoed throughout the station. It was here Nathan discovered the old man. What Nathan saw he can only describe was a mirage of a homeless man. A shopping cart filled with miscellaneous findings, raggedy clothing, and a disgruntled face hidden behind a barrage of tangled and unkempt hair. But it was one thing Nathan had noticed from this old man, a constant muttering that seemed to synchronize with the ticking of the clocks. No more, said the old man. 
Nathan noticed more characteristics about this man as he came further down the station hallway. His shoes were dilapidated and unbuckled Doc Martens, but they also looked as if they might be legitimate military issue boots. He had shiny medallions and decorative award pins on his coat lapels that jingled when he walked. And he was pushing along an exceptionally large number of clocks in a discount shopping bin. Clocks of various size, colors, and mechanical workings. Nathan found that all the clocks, no matter how ravaged or how beaten they looked, ticked louder than such one he had ever heard before. And as the old man passed him, he heard the mumbling of those two words. Nathan began to wonder what exactly this man's story was. What decisions led this man becoming who he was today? How does someone end up in a similar situation as this? Nathan wondered how he could prevent himself from ending up in this situation. But then he began to think. What if something like this is inevitable for just about anyone? You come into this world, you pay your debts, you live your life, fight the good fights, and love whoever loves you. But then you end up pushing a cart full of clocks down a bus station hallway, muttering to yourself in consequential dribble. Perhaps this is an inescapable fate for some. Nathan began to think about what his fate will bring. But before he could think about anything scarier than this, he made a blunt decision to accept whatever comes to him. Ten more minutes till the bus comes. Hope dinner is still warm, Nathan thinks. Gabriel Schneider is a citizen of Cherokee Nation attending IAI, pursuing a degree in creative writing and indigenous liberal studies. Gabriel is a passionate advocate for re, re, revitalization of the Cherokee language and works in, with fluid first language speakers to host language classes for citizens of the three federally recognized Cherokee tribes, the United Kitawa Band, Cherokee Nation, and the Easter Band of Cherokee Indians. Please welcome Gabriel Schneider. Howdy, I'm back. This story was written as kind of just a fun little thing uh, with Easter coming up a couple weeks ago. It's called The Rabbit Lives. The rabbit lives in a hole at the center of the world, starving and destitute, amalgamated from bits and pieces of traditions ancient and modern, carefully chosen for commercial appeal, by humans engaged in a peculiar form of alchemy. Confused and lonely, her teeth had long ago been removed, and she no longer knew what color her fur had originally been, bleached white as it was by her, captives, by her captors over so many decades. Once yearly, she was forced by her captors, begging and screaming into servitude, forced to leave behind hidden baskets and eggs filled with sugary concoctions to rot away the small teeth of children, rendering the offerings to the fairies worthy of little, beyond, little reward beyond nickels and dimes. The rabbit meant something more to ancient peoples long forgotten, their descendants now partaking in a new form of worship, changed as they were by a changed world. There were no longer offerings. She was not even granted the pitiful trifles given to Nicholas as recompense for his own yearly torment. She yearned for the erasure granted to others like her, better that than the distortion she now suffered. The only solace granted to her was the memory of what she once was, obscured by the distance of time. The rabbit sleeps, dreaming of forgotten days, when she was the living symbol of the gods of spring, renewal, fertility, and love. Thank you. 
Now I have the pleasure of presenting Temateo Montoya. Temateo Montoya is an enrolled member of the Lipan Apache Band of Texas. He lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he spends his days lying under junipers, writing, reading, creating electronic music, mountain biking, and supporting others through his life, I mean through his work as a life coach. His artistic work largely revolves around indigenous futurisms in which he has multimedia projects under the name Cathartis, a podcast called the Indigenous Futures Podcast, and a writing project that includes a series of indigenous futurist science fiction novels. Is there somebody I need to next? Okay. Hey, y'all. <clears throat> Thank you, Gabe. Um, all right, I have a just an essay here for you. And yeah, let me get it all set up. I didn't have a printer, so I got to deal with an iPad. So this is a piece called Another Native Writer, Another Coyote Metaphor. I learned about coyote from a man named Opler. Morris Edward Opler was an American anthropologist who wrote ethnographies about the folklores, kinship systems, and lifeways of many Athabascan tribes of the Southwest, my tribe, the Lipan Apache, uh, included. <clears throat> Opler was a good man, by all accounts, and by all accounts, I mean exclusively his writings in his Wikipedia page. I never met him. I remember pawing through his book on Lipan folklore when I received it, looking for something vital, identity forming, life giving. It was a gift from my father. I would buy the book over and over again after gifting it to visiting family members, all in the hopes that they could help me find what I was looking for between the pages. They couldn't. In Opler's book, there are quite a few stories about Coyote. I remember reading them and feeling a bit unfulfilled. I wanted more. I wanted some wisdom that would be up there with the words of John Trudell and Black Elk, um, the, the ones I grew up with as an urban turned rural native. I didn't get that. I got something I couldn't understand. 13, after school, green. I was 13 when I was attacked for the first time. A short kid with big bags under his eyes and an angry quick walk came up to me while I was sitting and laughing with my friends. He punched me in the face two times before I knew what was happening. My friend jumped up to defend me, only to be intercepted by a tall, muscular teen a few steps away. As I rinsed my face in the nearby stream and watched my blood and tears swirl with the dark waters and leached oak leaves, I asked myself why over and over and over again. My body still holds on to uh, that question. I've learned to read between the words in Opler's transition, or translations. I tried for too long to make sense of them directly. There would be odd verbs and nouns that seemed out of place or incorrect. There would be words like dragon to describe some being instead of calling it a spirit or a monster. I would reread each passage attempting to translate it back to some semblance of indigeneity. I was sure it innately held that Opler had just misinterpreted somehow. I started to hate Opler. I figured he was just a white savior type. Got his kicks by leaving his family and extracting information from native peoples to satisfy his PhD theses. I doubted he felt any sense of connection with the people he interviewed or the lands on which they lived, but he sure wrote a lot of books. Home, 13, Sierra Foothills of Northern California. After the meeting was over, lunch was served, and the folks who had stayed up all night praying were ready to head home. I went down toward my house, looking to clean up a bit before saying goodbye. The supple green valley in the Sierras I called home drank in the early spring sun. The heat felt good on my skin after the long cold night. I took a detour before I got to my house. I climbed up on the roof of our tool shed, took my shirt off, and laid out on the hot sandy tiles and started tanning myself. I wanted to look more like my uncles, whose brown singing faces and deep voices were fresh in my mind. It was vitally important to me important in that moment for me to lay under the sun. My 13-year-old self didn't know why. My body still holds on to that question. I read a story from Opler's book on Lipon folklore called Coyote Helps Lizard Hold Up the Sky. When I first read that title, it had promise. It seemed grand, important even, a story that could help explain why the sky is the way it is, why we are the way we are. 
When I first read it, I figured it was just a kid's tale, just a joke so we could laugh at the stupidity of Coyote. Right before Coyote was about to eat Lizard, Lizard told him that the Satol stalk he was resting on was holding up the sky, and he needed help holding it up because he was getting weak. Coyote obliged and supported the Satol stalk by himself, afraid of being crushed by the sky. Lizard ran away, promising to bring back water and food. It took Coyote a whole day in the desert, uh, in the desert sun, before he learned that he had been duped by Lizard. He was left hot, hungry, and miserable. A quaint enough story, certainly nothing mythic or important. I was disappointed. On the bottom of the page, in nearly indiscernible print, Opler wrote some footnotes for this story saying, this is not just a, ch a children's tale. Every, tor every story they tell has a point. This story was supposed to teach the young children not to take things at face value and to be careful with who you trick or take advantage of. They may remember you and seek retribution. Opler taught me what my own people's stories were supposed to mean. Maybe he wasn't such a bad guy. His Wikipedia said that he worked with the Japanese internment camps in the 40s and was a strong voice of reason against them. Why did Opler do the work he did? His Wikipedia won't say. Maybe he just hated his wife and liked to get out of the house. Highway 26, near Hatch, New Mexico, 30, Sunday. I left the Arizona desert with a busted lip and a bad sunburn. My voice, dry and cracked, surprised me as I ordered fast food in a tiny border town. It was a weekend I wouldn't forget, a weekend with good friends and teachers, the kind you leave feeling exhausted, but much stronger, more deeply held. I'd been driving for a couple hours, simmering deep in thought. The sun had just set behind the Gila, leaving the landscape tinted a purple hue that drew away all the greens and grays from the world. The tires of my car cracked with the change in the cement surface as I went over a bridge. The royal underneath was dry, like so many other bridges in New Mexico. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him, Coyote, dodging into the grass on the side of the road. He was alone from what I could see. I wondered if he saw a lizard there in that grass, and, he lift, and if he listened to its lies or not. I tried to make some meaning of seeing him. Maybe he had a message for me. Maybe he would tell me what I'd always been looking for. Maybe we just happened to be in the same place at the same time. My body still holds on to those questions. I fill my mind with the footnotes. I think I'm living there more often than in the stories themselves, hoping to find the answers laid out plainly. Thank you for your footnotes, Morris Edward Opler, you privileged son of a bitch. Thank you for writing, for caring, for saving, for riding in fully clad on the white horse of academia. Thank you for leaving your family behind and spending time with the people you surely loved instead. Damn you, and thank you. I'm not sure how he would feel about that last sentence. Did he know when he wrote his textbooks that their overpriced plastic covers would be on the dusty bookshelves of the descendants of the peoples he wrote about instead of in the hands of every Southwest Anthropology 101 student? Was that conceivable to him, that we were still here? If he had known that, would he have written them differently? Would he have paid attention to certain aspects more closely? Would he add in the footnotes how much they laughed when they told their stories, their cheeks rising so high their eyes were forced closed? Would he show us detailed graphs of how they held their hands during important parts of the story, how their fingers and lips arced between lively gestures and smoking cigarettes? Would he tell us what he felt when he heard the stories? Would he tell us if they made his eyes well up and nose run, or if they made his skin crawl? Would he even tell us if he believed the stories they told? Did he even know why he was really there amongst my people and their lands? Kochi Stronghold, Dragoon Mountains, 30, Saturday. I woke up close to 3.30 AM. The temperature had dropped below 20, and my head felt like it was in an ice bucket while the rest of me sweated. My body was sore from the long hike the day before, and the mix of hot and cold only made that more apparent. I tossed and turned for an eternal 10 minutes before situating myself with a beanie and an extra blanket. The nylon tent was doing little to keep, out, to keep anything out but wind. That's when I heard them, coyotes, a lot of them. They yapped and yapped, their voices reverberating through the night. It was impossible to tell where they were located, but it was somewhere in the amphitheater of hills I found myself in. What I could tell was that they were together, not spread out over the landscape. They were singing from one place. I drank them in, too tired to question for whom or for what reason they sang and chatted. I just let them do it. They sang my body to sleep. No questions this time. 
I pray for him nowadays. I grieve that I needed Opler. I dare anybody to make it easier and simpler than it is, to make things black and white and still be satisfied. There's always something between the words. There are always people between worlds. When we force answers and conclusions, this or that, to the things that matter, we belittle them. They are meant to be lived in, these questions, to be attended to, breathed into, given life and mystery. They are meant to be misunderstood and then clarified in the tiny text of the footnotes and then relinquished back into their own confused sovereignty so they continue to teach us more about ourselves and the world. I don't trust lizards, but I wonder at Satol's stalks piercing the sky from the limestone rooting. I wonder how my ancestors' eyes sparkled when they told their stories to a white man who asked too many questions. I wonder why we long for what we aren't, why we question what we're missing, why we seek captive wholeness when questions expand the edges of ourself. I wonder at junipers whipping in the wind. I wonder if they have a story for me and what, and what it is about. I wonder if coyote's coat changes through the seasons just like mine. I wonder if I'll ever get close enough for one, uh, to one for it to tell me. My body still holds on to those questions. And there's a footnote here. Um, I hope Opler would say something here about how the world is given life through our questions, not the answers to them. I hope he would tell us what he had learned, that he had learned that from a great elder I had never heard of who had many wonderful tales to tell. I hope he would encourage me to be like that elder one day. Thank you. All right. Now I would like to introduce the Art and Conversation presenters, Daisy Quezada, Michelle Preslick, and Triana Reed. Good evening, folks. My name is Daisy Casadreña, and I'm faculty in the Studio Arts program here at IAI. Um, I'm also artist liaison for the Artist in Residency program, and I'm here this afternoon to share uh, a project um, with some of the students here, or as some students might know it, as the assignment, the Art in Conversation. <laughs> Um, at its origin, this project, the Art in Conversation, was developed to build relations and a critical reflection through an exchange between departments. Through dialogue, these conversations allowed for students an opportunity to share knowledge that cross academic spaces. Within our, within our respected degree tracks, there are times people dismiss or rather become enamored with the individual and the promotion of the self that veers on dominant mindset. This is rare among folks who are um, community-centered, but the ego is a common part of feeling, thinking, and behaving that we as humans possess and that we should consider and be aware of. In recognition, in recognizing the importance of creating a learning climate and openness, um, this communications project brings together creative writing and studio arts students for an art conversation on their works. Today I have the pleasure to share this space with two of our recent participants, uh, Triana Reed Yay. Um, and Michelle Preslick. Um, Triana is a recent IAI graduate in creative writing and Michelle is graduating this spring semester and currently has work up at the IAI Balzer Gallery and uh, Mokna. Um, to start us off, um, I'd like to play a quick sample of their conversation. So. Uh, my name is Michelle Preslick, and my name is Triana Reed, and we are here for the Art in Conversation, talking about Michelle's work and my poetry. <laughs> I kind of wanted to start talking about connection and how you see that working in, in your pieces, both the idea of connection between the artist and what is being made, and also you know, a lot of your pieces are segments coming together to make a whole. And then to totally throw that out of proportion and talk about how connection has been changed or shifted during the pandemic and how you see that influencing your work and how you 
value human connection and how you think it's changed and if there's a, a rightness in that or any way of moving forward with human connection in, in these times where we you know can't touch each other and are scared of breath if you have anything to say yeah I, I think that we have a deep need for human connection right now in the midst of so many people being isolated not getting to see each other's face, facial yeah. expressions, physical touch. Uh, now is a really challenging time for so many people mm -hmm. with regards to connection. Human connection has all, always been an important theme mm -hmm. in, in my work. I do think that I'm bringing even more attention to it now. Mm -hmm from a personal place and mm -hmm. also from um, just sort of bearing witness to what I see people suffering through. What are some of the themes that you're working with these days? For Senior Project, I said that I was exploring ideas around home, ritual, and connection, mm -hmm. intimate connection, or human mm -hmm. connection. That's extended to connection to the living world as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a very broad umbrella of very big things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I loved what you said. I don't know if it was in your artist statement or your artist bio, but about learning um, from the natural world, like what can we glean from the relationship between mycelium and trees, for example, or... Um, and I, this is something I want to be touching on in my poetry, but um, how does one learn from the natural world? Is it, I mean, I question whether it's just spending time in nature or if it's a lot of, um, you know, I learned about mycelium from a novel. Um, so like the translation of science into the arts and how that happens and how art reaches like a different part of the human being as opposed to like scientific data where we could go through like research papers about how trees talk to mycelium which is beautiful no matter how it's presented but I think there's a like it hits a different part of the human being when it's presented through art And as an addition to that, um, I'm going to, thank you for listening, um, I'm going to invite uh, Trian and Michelle to maybe provide a few thoughts or sort of feedbacks or of their experience um, being a part of this uh, project. So that's it. Okay. Um, Thanks for listening. That was kind of akin to having your journal read out loud in a public setting, but um, we're here now. So um, I, I want to say that the Art and Conversation project was really wonderful. Triana was one of the first people I met I, in uh, Annie McDonald's English class, and uh, we've developed a friendship. I would say she's a friend and also a kindred. And so it was really nice to be paired with her for this art and conversation piece where she got to share about her poetry and I got to share about my studio arts practice. And we kind of just, um, I think, gained a different perspective by listening and talking with one another. So um, it was really, I think, beneficial for us both to, to have that opportunity. So thanks for making it happen. I have no idea what to say, so whatever comes out anyway. Um, it's strange listening to one's own voice, but it was um, a really beautiful opportunity to be able to talk about um, Michelle's work, but also about my own work. I feel like it's not something that's normally done, and I think I gained a perspective on, on the themes that I enjoy focusing on in my poetry. Um, yeah, like Michelle said, it was almost just 
any of the conversations we have with each other. Um, so it was really nice to be able to talk to somebody who had really similar um, ideas and just wants in their art. Um, thanks for listening. I don't know. <laughs> okay. And I just want to say a quick thanks to the Creative Writing Program for um, teaming up with Studio Arts for making this a possibility and an exchange between departments. Thank you. And now we will be opening it up for questions from all the folks here and on social media. You can ask questions of the editors, of the readers, anything you like. Okay, so the question was accepting uh, accepting the submissions for the editors here. So, Debon, would you like to come up and help me answer that question? Whatever you want. Whatever I want. Yeah, it's a Q and A. Um, I speak for myself when I say this that when I. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it was, I don't want to say anything that might get me in trouble. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to get in trouble. Um, initially, our, the theme for this, uh, the theme for this semester was, a. Uh, it was pretty broad. And we kind of felt it was a bit wrong of us to, uh, to tell anyone that their, uh, their story or their poetry did not fit the theme. Uh, you know, the burn to emerge theme, I believe, was coined by, we came to an agreement as a group, but I believe it was initially coined by Rebecca Santos, um, who is not here today. Um, I believe that was, uh, that was one of the themes that she put forth. Um, and initially, we were going to have it much more zeroed in as a theme, but this, this year we accepted, uh, we, we opened up our submissions pretty substantially. And being that the theme is largely about, you know, coming out of, you know, these past couple years of COVID as things uh, sort of, things started to get a little bit better and the way that that, uh, the way that, that impacted people's lives. Um, I think that most of our submissions had an element of that and we were able to get that in, thankfully. We accepted almost, we accepted, we were able to accept most things that came in. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much for coming here today, and I final round of applause for all of the speakers today, all of the readers, and thank you all for your submissions. And the anthology will be launching within the next two weeks, and a final thank you as well to Douglas Boots for giving the blessings today. Thank you.